Howdy, everybody. This is David Reichel with the Sierra Avalanche Center. I'm psyched to be talking uh, with Brandon Schwartz, lead forecaster with Sierra Avalanche Center today. Howdy, Brandon. Hey, good afternoon. Good to see you. So we're talking, and just by kind of random coincidence, today happens to technically be the first day that you're back on uh, uh, paid status with as a forecaster with uh, the Forest Service. Uh, congrats or condolences to be back at work a little bit, I guess. Always happy to be back to work. It's a day I look forward to. Good positive attitude. Uh, what, what, how do you occupy your time um, over the summer? What are some well, highlights? I a, yeah, I spent a good ton of time teaching wilderness medicine courses and I spent a lot of time on my mountain bike and a bit of time sailing out there on Lake Tahoe and some good family camping time and good fishing on the river and a nice rafting trip as well was thrown in there. So it was definitely a good summer all around. That sounds like high value. You did all the things. Pretty much, pretty much. There's always room for, not quite room, but there's always desire at least for a couple more or to make room for a couple more that never quite fit in. It's summer is a, at the last bit of summer it goes by way too fast. Or all of it. That's true, that's true. Um, you just on the um, wilderness medicine uh, topic for a second. You've been teaching those courses. I mean, wilderness first aid, wilderness first responder, uh, uh, yeah, and uh, wilderness uh, first responder research for for a while. Um, any highlights? Uh, how long you've been doing that? Yeah, so I've been teaching for I guess one of the the major provider organizations of that for the last twenty one years, and. Um, you know, the highlights is always seeing the involving in curriculum and seeing uh, kind of new young people come in that sort of remind me of how I was 30 years ago or so and uh, just helping kind of move those folks along towards their journey of education for life in remote settings. Yeah, I have not been teaching that class for that long, but I've been recertifying my, my woofer for I think about that long as well. And I certainly recall uh, you know, one of the classic opening things is like, how many times have you restarted your uh, woofer or whatever it is? And the number, uh, my number is now more than most of the students by far. Definitely uh, feeling the gray in my beard when that intro session during the woofer research. But it's an awesome course. I mean, I definitely think that it's such a good piece of information for our sort of the folks that we're talking to, even though it's not at all avalanche -y. Uh, so transitioning from that to uh, forecaster side of things, um, uh, what, what's on your plate for you know the next couple of weeks as you uh, uh, get ready for the season from the for forecaster uh, forest service perspective? Yeah, so first things is just to basically start to brush off the dust and demoff all the the program that was hung up for the summer. And so you know, I started this morning actually going through some of my gear and just double checking things like airbag triggers and uh, other things to verify that everything's working as I expected it to be when I left it in the springtime, kind of on my end of season gear check and just make sure that nothing weird happened in the off season. And then starting to look at a lot of admin duties that we deal with this time of year, uh, as far as dealing with budgeting and um, getting the funding happening between the Forest Service and the Sierra Avalanche Center nonprofit partner to make everything work as it does so wonderfully. And then thinking about other things like just getting snow tires on trucks and all the little tasks that need to happen to get us ready for our season. And then also starting to plan towards, um, as the other forecasters come back on in two weeks uh, to get uh, just a training that we need to do, looking at our avalanche rescue, looking at our uh, wilderness medicine response for any injuries that may happen in the backcountry setting. and. Um, just running through some skill sessions on that stuff. And then also starting to look through more paperwork with like our pre-trip planning. And we have a pretty robust system for uh, pre-trip planning and tracking ourselves in the field, but just always digging through it with a fine tooth comb and see where we can make tweaks, make things better in that process for sure. So I've had the opportunity to go out in the field with the forecasters several times and um, you know, all of us as best practices, be it a recreational backcountry traveler or any sort of professional backcountry uh, ski guide, avalanche instructor, should have this pre-trip process and kind of a checking out and letting folks know where you're going and, and that sort of thing. Um, you know, as a 
employee of the federal government and the Forest Service, um, yours is great and follows that process, but can you sort of walk through the steps that you do? Yeah, so it's really just a, a robust version of a lost person plan, uh, trying to take any incident of a mishap and have us a, a plan for how we're going to deal with it. So we're not trying to wing it since that's not a super repeatable tactic for success. We got a plan for what we're going to follow. And then also to, um, if there's any outside like search and rescue response required, um, eliminate any search portion of it and turn it into just rescue to make their lives a lot easier to support uh, anyone needed in the field. So it starts with um, the, some documents like I'm working on right now that uh, just outline the whole structure of what's expected from a pre-trip plan so that we can create consistent plans that uh, have the information we need day to day. And then it has like the daily planning phases and that stuff really starts to focus in on who's going, where they're going and what they have with them so that someone can pull up a, a, a page and look at the list and be like, okay, so this is who we know we're looking for. And this is the gear that they have given the expected weather conditions that they're dealing with right now, how they're going to be able to fare through that, uh, what their immediate needs might be, and then also where we expect to find vehicles parked, uh, and then be able to go there and see, like, yep, sure enough, the vehicle's here. Uh, this is certainly a, a last known position for those folks, and then move on out into the field with documentation of where we plan on being working, and through that process, and sometimes we're using satellite tracking devices, so our exact location is known even beyond uh, just like a trailhead known position or something like that. And then, uh, you know, we have check-in, check-out procedures that we use with um, either Forest Service dispatch or other responsible individuals at certain times when Forest Service dispatch might not be available. And we're just checking out when we're leaving the office, when we're on scene, when we're moving on the snow, when we're off the snow, when we're driving back, and then when we're done with our outing uh, for the day. But sometimes the winter driving conditions might be the most hazardous portion of the day. So we track that time as well. I, I always get a kick um, when I'm with you all and uh, with the forecasters and you radio in to dispatch and I, I don't even remember, but it's like Placerville or something. It's it's not always like, you know, Truckee. It, it can be a little bit of a ways away because that's where dispatch is. Yeah, they're down there in Grass Valley. And so there's a pretty robust uh, radio repeater network uh, around the Lake Tahoe Basin that uh, allows us to communicate with them. Yeah, it's totally effective. And it just seems, I, I it, like I said, I get a kick out of it. It's a little bit more uh, high tech or pro or just organized than, you know, letting your significant other know where you're going and which is what so many of the recreational public will do. Um, sweet. In terms of uh, maybe transitioning a little bit to thinking about last season, um, you know, every winter is uh, interesting here and average hardly exists at all, but uh, last winter was definitely a, a tale of some extremes. Um, you want to walk us through your, you know, highlights or thoughts on last season? Yeah. Um, so let's see, thinking back there, uh, we started with that late October event that laid down a couple of feet of snow that uh, melted pretty quickly on all the solar aspects, but held in there on the shaded aspects. And even though the temps were warm, uh, this time of year, just the nights are so long that even when it's quote warm during the day, it's like, oh, it's up in the 50s, something like that. It only lasts for a couple hours and the, the temperatures in those shady um, north aspects, the lower sun angles this time of year, they're cold for a lot of hours through the 24 hour cycle. And even though those air temps are warm, you still get shallow snowpack processes just like you see anywhere. So we saw fasting going on in those north aspects that were uh, holding softer snow. Some of them had gone rain crust and melt freeze and they were a little bit more robust, but um, we were tracking a lot of those areas with those softer facets. And then finally, when uh, we started getting more significant snowfall around Christmas time, um, we started getting some deep slabs on those early season shallow facets that were there. And then we were able to move on from that um, avalanche cycle. And then things got um, a bit more kind of typical day to day for our snow climate with wind slabs and storm slabs, more direct action type avalanches. There was a pretty solid uh, wind slab event uh, that I remember uh, there, at, I believe it was in January, where um, there's just a lot of low density drifting snow through a, a wind event on a sunny day. And there's quite a bit of 
D1, D2, avalanche activity, natural avalanche activity from that. And then we went into that big prolonged period of drought and melt that lasted us uh, pretty much well into April when we started getting snowfall again in April to uh, kind of give us a little bit of return of better conditions, but it's probably the season in a nutshell. That was, I think, a, a quite good uh, recap of, of the season. Certainly uh, January, February, March were impressively dry. I don't have a number on the tip of my tongue, but I believe SAC set a record for the most number of low forecast days forecast consecutively, which is a slightly boring record to set. Yeah, and the, one of the interesting things was watching the melt on the solar aspects during that time and just things returning to full bare ground in so many places that uh, we just really hadn't seen uh, happen quite so widespread uh, in a lot of recent times. Another, I, I'm on the southern end of our forecast area and uh, you know, the roll of the dice last winter was a little bit extra rough for us um, in terms of total snow accumulations. And towards the end of that three month dry spell, um, I was definitely watching, you know, the, yeah, the solar slopes like shrink to like gullies, you know, and um, places that I was able to travel more broadly on, you know, months earlier were definitely uh, melting away and the options were getting more and more limited. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of that snowfall north versus south, as you were saying, was definitely driven by latitude more so than elevation. And so mm -hmm. there was uh, literally the snow tail sensors in the far northern portion of the forecast area had literally twice the amount of snow on the ground as what was down in the Carson Pass and Ebbets Pass zones. And it made a big difference. I remember we were talking at some point last winter and uh, you or Andy, someone suggested, you know, looking at the... Uh, the, our list of observations, snow tell sites and everything in the tabular format. And uh, you could just see it, you know, when you have it in sort of range north to south, you could just see the snow depth, like at wherever that is, Emerald Bay, Meeks Bay, somewhere roughly in the middle of our zone. And it just starts to change. And again, for someone on the Southern end, it was a little bit uh, grim. Yeah, there's some cool visualizations you can do with that weather page on the SAC website and that weather map page going back and forth, as you're saying, between the maps and the tables. and pulling out the various parameters you want to look at. It's a pretty user-friendly spot to see some cool, interesting things. Yep, hopefully, it, I mean, I, I don't want it to be like reversed so that it's bad for you and good for me this coming winter, but I, I would like it not to be so bad for me this winter, we'll see. Um, we talked a little bit about uh, the string of low danger um, that we had last season. And over this summer, um, the powers that be, the um, National Avalanche Center and uh, Canadian Avalanche Canada, released sort of an, up, an update to the North American Avalanche Danger Scale. I thought maybe we could just spend a few minutes talking about that. And uh, yeah. if you want to start talking about that, Brandon, I'm going to try and uh, share my screen so that folks can see what we're talking about. Yeah, so it's definitely a, a light overhaul refresh on the North American Avalanche Danger Scale. And there's um, still all the same five levels of danger, low, moderate, considerable, high, extreme. For each of those that have an icon, travel advice, likelihood, size, and distribution, um, that's where some of the little tweaks are in that. So if we're looking at the icons that are there, we can see now that there's a separate icon for extreme and uh, danger where it used to be the same icon as for high danger. And then a little tweak to the travel advice next to extreme there, helping to, I think, allow people to understand extreme danger better and why it's used so infrequently with the extraordinarily dangerous avalanche conditions and travel advice to avoid all avalanche terrain. Definitely different than the high danger travel avalanche and avalanche terrain is not recommended um, with that. And so that's, that's quite a big deal to say, avoid all avalanche terrain, avoid those slopes in the trees over 30 degrees and um, a lot of places that um, are not always unstable during high danger and sometimes are, that would be more of a dependent upon the specific avalanche problem than the avalanche danger itself. But extreme takes a blanket and throws it all over all of those avalanche terrain, all aspects. And then looking down there at the far right, the size and distribution, again, extreme, very large avalanches in many areas, high danger, large avalanches in many areas. And so large is talking about a size D3 on the destructive potential scale. So something large enough to break a few trees, uh, maybe damage like a semi truck. Um, versus the very large avalanches, we're talking the D4s, the D5, stuff that's going to take out a stick frame house or bigger than that, start to destroy like a, a group of buildings and things like that. So um, 
you know, seeing a lot of D3s and having those being in fairly specific areas with a wind slab problem, you know, it's going to go along with high danger pretty well versus the next step up at extreme, even during our, our bigger storms. But if we were dealing with some sort of more persistent uh, type weak layers, if we're burying surface hoar, if we're burying early season facets, we're burying multiple weak layers that we're going to think are being failing deep in the snowpack with high certainty, um, that might pull out the extreme uh, danger rating in that type of situation. But anytime we're on the fence in between these, because as convenient as the danger scale is, it puts things in nice boxes. They're totally human created boxes and the world of avalanches being a natural phenomenon doesn't fit neatly into our nice little boxes. And so sometimes we end up on the fence between danger ratings. And our guidance is always to default to the travel advice, which travel advice best paints the picture for the day, even if the likelihood and, or size and distribution don't seem to line up quite perfectly with the danger scale. We opt for travel advice and um, I think that helps to create the best message. And that's, that's uh, all consistent across a, a national level of avalanche centers in the North America. I think that was uh, well said, um, you know, it's, very common that um, advanced, you know, readers of forecasts kind of key in on those times when the forecast, you know, when nature is like doing its best to um, challenge our little graph and our boxes here, right? Like sort of trying to ride the edges or to be more fluid than these boxes um, sort of uh, would like it to be. Um, and, uh, you know, sort of sharing the travel advice is like the, the uh, column you know, that we default to, to try and give useful information, I think is helpful for users who are um, sometimes, you know, challenged by challenging snowpacks. Yeah, and sometimes you might see that again down like on the border of moderate and considerable with, if we look at the likelihood, we talk about uh, differences in natural avalanche likelihood. Um, but if, again, if the, you're not thinking the naturals might happen, but for some reason with the difficulty of uh, the specific avalanche problem being harder to manage, you might get a considerable day out of that, even if you're not expecting uh, natural avalanche conditions. And so again, that's kind of default to the travel advice. Yeah. I think in addition to some of the, um, you know, small changes that we talked about, folks will probably notice just graphic design changes, you know, sort of the the look of it has been cleaned up and maybe modernized in some ways. Um, you know, the numbers, the one, two, three, four, five used to be next to the icons. Now they're not a few things like that. You know, I, I don't know the percentage, but to my quick look, I mean, 90% of this scale is the same as it was last year. Um, and, uh, you know, there's been a, a few, uh, I think good appropriate tweaks, but it's not going to require a, people uh, start from the beginning with your avalanche education. I don't think. No, it's just, Sorting out some of the minor details uh, with a bit more definition, I think. Uh, otherwise, yeah, anyone with familiarity with the uh, danger scale used up through last year for North America, then this one will fall right in. Cool. Um, I think I'm going to stop sharing the screen there. Nice. Um, thinking ahead uh, towards this season, Brandon. Um, you know, I think you mentioned just a moment ago, um, in a couple of weeks, the other two forecasters will come back and, you know, the, the plan is to have the same crew as the last few years um, going forward and um, more or less the same uh, operations from the forecast. Yeah, so that's a real luxury for us to have that kind of stability that anytime you have a big personnel changes as an avalanche center, it, um, usually sets you back a little bit before you're able to move forward uh, in advancements with those new people. And so being able to have the same three forecasters, myself, Andy Anderson, Steve Renault, and the same three professional observers, uh, yourself, David Reichel, Travis Feist, and Jason Billick, all coming back into their roles that they're familiar with and good at doing, that uh, that just creates solid stability for us and really helps us to move into uh, the season in a really efficient manner and just be able to identify the things that we want to do to help ourselves and then move on from there versus worrying about uh, trying to train up anyone new uh, into their roles where they're not having full understanding of those roles. Um, and as soon as the snow flies, you know, we, we, we try and start being able to provide some amount of information, even if we're not fully ready on our background workup stuff from getting the program up and running. 
um, having those same folks in their roles is, is helpful to getting information out to the public. Can you walk us through that? So, you know, last year we did have that big snowfall in October when I think is before we're capable of, of having full forecasting operations. Um, but what is our usual, uh, the, the usual steps when we get those, you know, one foot storms where uh, if you walk a really long way, you might be able to find some, some turns or something, but it's not quite uh, game on yet. Yeah, so, um, you know, once we start having some snow on the ground, we start looking at it. And it's definitely the words I got from a mentor years ago is if you got snow on the ground, you better be looking at it. And so just seeing how that change process happens, because that's one of the things that's interesting for us and for um, the other backcountry users to be able to work with the information on how those snow crystals are changing on the ground over time. And as I mentioned earlier with the um, cold north aspects, long nights, lots of shadows, this time of year with low sun angles. Um, we started just looking at how that snow is accumulating, the crystals are changing on the ground and whether or not they're gonna be problematic weak layers. And if we're seeing slopes that have enough continuous snow cover for that, or whether we're just seeing a vast majority of slopes are still quite broken up with obstacles, rocks, logs, et cetera, trees that uh, don't allow a weak layer to be very connected and allow for long propagation. So we start getting out and looking at that stuff. We usually start on foot, um, just hiking out and looking at the snow and hiking back. And um, unless it's a, a banner year where it goes from mountain biking to full on skiing a couple of days later with a very large storm, we usually build up kind of slow like everyone else around the country does. And so we spend a lot of time on foot before we usually get onto our skis at all. And just seeing all those areas around the forecast area and starting to map out the snowpack and the forming leak layers that uh, may be starting to happen. And they usually are just because, like I said, a shallow snowpack is a shallow snowpack anywhere you are. And so usually that snow is getting weak, whether it's gonna be a play or not, goes back to some of those anchoring pieces with the rocks and logs, et cetera, I've mentioned. Yeah, I try to encourage folks that, you know, early season when it's sharky with lots of obstacles, um, may not be the best time to, to go big, moving quickly on any anything in the, in the back country, but it's an awesome time to go slow and dig holes and look at the snow. You know, snowpack is shallow, so it's easy to go to the ground and we, you very often will see interesting stuff. Um, it's a good time to start monitoring that. Um, in terms of the, uh, the products, like what we put on our website, what, what, are the, what do we put up um, before, you know, if we're going out doing these uh, boot based uh, missions uh, before we've sort of started full forecasting operations? So as we would any time in the winter, we'll have you know, observations, posting to the observation section of the website, just cataloging the data with um, various media that will bring in and narrative stuff. And then if there's products going up on the forecast page, they'll start with general avalanche information that's different than the forecast stuff without danger ratings. And it'll work through that and just give more kind of summary type information. And we'll update that as necessary. And then usually somewhere in uh, in November to somewhere by December 1, we usually have enough going on that it warrants starting to create the forecast product. And so once we start those, we roll those daily uh, through the season until usually about the third or fourth weekend in April. Sounds good. Uh, looking forward to it. I mean, the little bit of snow this weekend and the cold temps definitely make it feel like it, it's, it's happening sooner. And I definitely saw a few friends uh, in Utah and elsewhere, uh, make some some turns this weekend, which is kind of shocking. Yeah, and we'll see how it continues to build. We've, you know, like you said, we got our first little dusting that's probably going to be the one to stick around now as our first base layers on those north aspects, and then maybe another dusting this week, and then you know, like it's looking like every few days right now we got some kind of little disturbance coming through, and every little change in the weather is going to do something to that snow on the ground there. So uh, we'll, be, we'll be starting to look at it here and not too long from now. Sounds good. Brandon, thanks a ton for uh, spending some time talking with us today. You are welcome. Thanks for having me.